Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second session in our premier Pulse virtual series. My name is Brad Blackwell, and I'm a director with uh, SAS Pulse Growers. I also farm at Dinsmore. We are glad you could join us today for our virtual winter extension meetings. Uh, today's session will have a live question and answer panel at the end of the presentation, so don't forget to type your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel at any time. We will answer them in the discussion later. There are also some handouts that you can access through the GoToWeb uh, dashboard. Uh, we'll start today by thanking today's sponsor, McDougall Acres. And, uh, I'm now going to introduce Sherilyn Phelps. Sherilyn is the agronomy manager at SAS Pulse Growers. She has expertise in pulse production and agronomy with experience in extension and research from small plot to field scale projects. Before joining SBG, Sherilyn was a regional crop specialist in North Battleford. Joining today's with Sherilyn is going to be Ken Wall. Ken has a Bachelor of Science degree from the U of S. He spent 33 years researching salinity at the Research Center in Swift Current. And Ken has recently been working as an agronomist with Pioneer Co-op. Since pulses and chickpeas are a large part of the rotation in that area, he's been dealing with many issues in the pulse sector. Sherilyn and Ken will walk us through the latest update on chickpea health issues that have impacted growers in Southern SAS the past couple of years. Welcome, Sherilyn and Ken. Thank you, Brad. Everyone can hear me and see my slides? So developing new crop options with the goal of at least one viable pulse crop for every arable acre of land in Saskatchewan is one of SPG's key strategic result areas. To ensure pulses are a profitable and sustainable option for all growers in Saskatchewan, we believe that fostering the adoption of minor crops like chickpeas is key to achieving this goal. SPG is supporting these efforts for chickpeas through a number of strategies and investments, and I wanted to highlight just a few of these things SPG is doing specifically related to chickpeas. SPG has recently refreshed the R&D strategy, which guides the work and investments we make in research and now includes a more intentional focus on the biggest issues for growers. In the shorter term, we are focusing on getting the right genetics grown in the right places around the province and determining and communicating the best agronomic practices for Saskatchewan pulses with an emphasis on weeds, disease, fertility, seeding rates, rotations, and harvest timing. For a couple of years now, we have been talking about SPG's role in pulse breeding and how that will be changing. SPG has had a long-term breeding agreement with the University of Saskatchewan for many years. We've invested more than 40 million in breeding and another 20 million in research supporting breeding at the Crop Development Center since 1997. SPG has released 129 pulse crop varieties royalty-free to producers over this time period. This agreement expired in September 2020. SPG was interested in continuing a similar agreement, but CDC wanted to move to a different funding model, similar to what they use for other crops, such as wheat, where there are multiple sources of funding. As we look forward, we anticipate that growers will pay for access to new varieties through royalties like you do on other crops. All the varieties developed under SPG's previous agreement with the CDC will remain royalty free. This will include varieties released this year and next. We are excited about the potential to partner with a number of private and public breeding programs to develop the best possible varieties for Saskatchewan producers. There will have to be an expected return on investment and value sharing with growers in order for us to invest. But that doesn't mean that we won't be working with the Crop Development Center. SPG recently announced new funding for chickpea breeding for three years at the University of Saskatchewan, a project that was co-funded through the Agriculture Development Fund and other funders and is specifically focused on breeding chickpea cultivars for Western Canada. In order to continue fostering the adoption of minor crops like chickpeas in Saskatchewan, agronomic constraints must be addressed. As many of you are aware, we have seen an unknown and unidentified plant health issue affect chickpeas across the province over the past two growing seasons. SPG has taken a lead role to identify what is going on in these fields, and I want to take a few minutes to share what we have done and where we are at. The plant health issue was brought to our attention in late July 2019, and we visited the hardest hit areas and gathered samples for evaluation by researchers. 
Unfortunately, there was no conclu conclusive results at that time, and we are hoping, and we were hoping, that it was just an anomaly in 2019. Of course, we were proven wrong, and in 2020, the issue did return. Fortunately, SPG was able to jump on it right away and see the fields early on. With public labs closed, we decided to send samples to a commercial lab, and with the help of a group of growers and agronomists, SPG was able to coordinate sample collection and gather field histories. The results from the plant samples came back in September and showed nothing significant that explains the chickpea health issue. There was no one residual herbicide, disease, or nutrient that seemed to be linked to this chickpea health issue. The establishment of the chickpea diagnostic team in September led by SPG through collaborations with experts in weeds, herbicides, diseases, insects, and fertility helped determine the next steps. This led to SPG coordinating the collection of soil samples in October and collaborating with researchers to do further testing. Underway is research at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon using the DNA scans to see if they can pull out populations of organisms that may be involved. Soil potassium and electrical conductivity levels are being evaluated by Dr. Jeff Shano at the University of Saskatchewan, and soil was also sent to Dr. Mario Tenuta at the University of Manitoba to be evaluated for nematodes. In November, SPG hosted a webinar, podcast, and developed a fact sheet that all showcased the results to date on the plant samples that were submitted. And those pieces of commu communication are still available on our website, and I encourage you to check those out if you have not seen them. In January, new project co-funding was announced through SPG and Saskatchewan Agriculture's Agriculture Development Fund to provide support to investigate the cause of this chickpea health issue and to try to reproduce the symptoms under controlled environments. This project will be carried out starting in 2021 by Drs. Michelle Hubbard and Dr. Sean Sharp at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, as well as Dr. Jeff Shano at the University of Saskatchewan. To summarize, the results to date, there is no one cause of the chickpea health issue, and it is very puzzling as well as very frustrating. We know through the work of agronomists on field histories that one consistency appears to be the environment. The majority of the fields were dry into late June in both 2019 and 2020. Rain events in late June and early July, as well as higher humidity, seem to be factors that occurred just prior to the symptoms developing. In some cases, whole fields were affected, and in others, only parts of the fields were impacted. And there was many comments made around some of these areas being areas where there was more compaction that seemed to be the worst hit areas. Such areas such as where tractors moved across the field, seed cart paths, headlands, but there was also random areas. Plant, plant samples results, as mentioned previously, showed nothing conclusive and left everyone with more questions on what the cause could be. Varieties were thought to be involved. Um, as in 2019, the CDC Orions appeared to be harder hit than CDC leaders. However, in 2020, both varieties were affected, as well as we saw the issue in DESI varieties as well. A theory is that the variety difference may be related to the differences in their flowering periods. CDC leaders flower four days later than CDC Orions, and that could mean that they are just at a susceptible stage at a different part during the growing season. The disease screening of healthy and unhealthy plants from the same field gave us insight into possible pathogens involved. There were a number of common root rot pathogens, such as Fusarium, Pythium, as well as some Pseudomonas species. For foliar pathogens, 100% of the samples did have Ascochyta, which is not surprising in chickpeas. However, there was no difference in the pathogens found between the healthy and unhealthy samples. This is a nematode that feeds on the outside of the root and not very easily seen with the naked eye. It is the first time parasitic nematodes have been found at these levels, and a reference point is in the blue on the graph to the right. So these on the bottom are the, the field identification numbers, and they're divided by healthy and unhealthy fields. And the blue level is set at 200 nematodes per 100 grams of soil. And Dr. Tenido, Tenido, 
suggests that levels above that can lead to definite health issues in plants within those fields. So this is the first time that we have found these levels at the, at, uh, the Prairie level, but we still need to dive into the data and confirm with DNA sequencing and with that, more samples are likely targeted for 2021. So from the 13 fields that we did evaluate to date, there is a higher prevalence in the unhealthy fields compared to the healthy fields. This means in some of the fields, high nematode levels could be part of the picture, but it is still not clear cut as there is also a high level in one of the healthy fields, which also warrants further investigation. SBG is looking forward to the results from the soil and plant DNA scans that are currently underway as those results may help confirm the nematode work and or identify other pathogens involved. Although we may not have a clear single answer for this issue in chickpeas right now, SPG has provided leadership and sought out collaborations to find solutions. SPG would like to thank all those who have been instrumental in collecting and analyzing samples as well as providing guidance to help identify possible causes and solutions. That provides an overview of the chickpea health issue as part of the opening remarks. So at this time, SPG would like to kick off our second Premier Pulse virtual series session. We are thankful for the opportunity to still connect with growers and agronomists, even if it is virtually this year. We look forward to reconnecting in person when you are able to do so again. Enjoy the presentations and I'm confident that you will gain powerful insights on the important topics today to either add chickpeas or make chickpeas more profitable as part of your farming operation. Back to you, Brad. Or on to Ken, sorry. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Ken Wall and I'm gonna be talking about uh, some chickpea disease management this morning. We all know that chickpeas are an important uh, <clears throat> pulse crop in many parts of the world. There's two main types, the large white seeded, uh, which is usually a thinner seed coat, the kabulis, as well as the smaller dark seeded types, which are the desis. Their drought tolerance and upright growth habit um, make uh, chickpeas a, a, a good option for the southern prairies, even in rolling or slightly rocky sites. Uh, however, diseases are one of the most important constraints to production, as, as anybody that's ever grown them will know. Some of the fungal diseases uh, prevalent in chickpeas are seedling blight, root rot, and wilt, ascochyta blight, sclerotinia stem rot, <coughs> white mold, botrytis, and pod rot, and gray mold. And there's also uh, several different diseases caused by bacteria and viruses. And generally, these are, are secondary to the, to the fungal diseases, <clears throat> as well as some non-infectious diseases, or really not diseases, but environmental stress and herbicide injury, um, although they are significant, as they often weaken the plant and make them more susceptible to some of the, the fungal infections. For this morning, in light of time, uh, I'm going to spend uh, concentrate uh, most or all of my time on ascochyta blight. I'm going to talk about some symptoms and life cycle, some control. I'm going to talk about integrated pest management, seed treatment, seed quality, scouting, fungicide applications and strategies, and then also spend just a couple of slides on uh, discussing biostimulants and biologicals. Ascochyta blight, um, caused by the fungus Ascochyta rabi, uh, and the sexual state is Dinamella rabi. Uh, Ascochyta blight is the most serious constraint to chickpea production in Western Canada. It affects all above ground plant parts at all growth stages and uh, can result in 100% yield loss. The infected seed is often shriveled and discolored, making it unsuitable for many food uses. The pathogen is normally found only on chickpea, but some isolates can infect field pea, bean, and, and other crop species. The lentil pathogen is slightly different. It's called Ascochyta lentis. Symptoms. Symptoms usually develop on the lower leaves as light brown lesions, often with dark margins and spread upwards as the plants grow. On stems, the lesions are usually darker, so the dark color of, of the margin is not always present or prominent. The lesions may, lesions may coalesce and become 
dotted with small black brooding bodies called pycnidia that often develop in concentric rings. Stems that are girdled by expanding lesions soon break and the foliage above the breakpoint dies. They're often found in circular patches in the field and uh, especially where the disease is spreading quickly. <clears throat> this is usually happening by the, the conidia um, spreading by, by rain splash. On resistant cultivars, dark brown pinprick lesions develop but do not progress. And lesions on the pods lead to infection, discoloration, and shrinking of the seed in often empty pods. A really quick look at the life cycle. Um, the pathogen overwinters on crop residue and in or on seed. And the infected seed is an important vehicle for spread of infection because the pathogen is readily transmitted from seed to seedlings. And when you look at the um, right hand side of the of the cycle the asexual cycle um, in some cultivars infected plants develop symptoms within four days within three to six days after lesion formation asexual pycnidia develop releasing thousands of conidia um, which are spread by rain splash and, and cause new infections very readily ascochyta is a polycyclic disease meaning several cycles of an infection and production of conidia can occur in a single season, especially if moisture and, and temperature are favorable. Infested residue can also be carried into nearby fields by wind. The sexual state uh, produces airborne ascospores, which develop on overwintered residue at the soil surface after fertilization. And uh, these pseudothesia produce ascospores, um, which look almost exactly like pycnidia. And it's assumed that in Saskatchewan, these ascospores are, are produced even before the, um, most often before the, the chickpea crop emerges and uh, carried by wind for long distances and, and uh, very, making the chickpea very susceptible. It's during this asexual or during the sexual production that uh, genetic recombination can occur, uh, which greatly can increase the ge genetic diversity of this disease. Some control methods, uh, integrated pest management strategies. The first one would be rotation. Uh, three to four years for sure between crop rotation to non-host crops is necessary. Uh, also in terms of field selection, do not plant chickpeas next to chickpea stubble. Uh, try to leave at least 500 meters between, between fields. Um, and wait at least two years before planting chickpeas on uh, previous or, or near previous stubble. Regarding seeding date, um, desis, it's recommended uh, to seed them when the minimum soil temperature reaches uh, at depth reaches seven degrees Celsius. And for kabulis, it's about 10 degrees Celsius. Planting should happen as soon as or as soon as possible after these soils reach these temperatures because of the long growth requirements of the crop. And it's generally um, recommended that after May 24th, um, move to a different crop, just because of the growth requirements of the chickpea crop. Seeding rate, use 1,000 kernel weight to calculate optimum stand densities, three to 3.3 established plants for kabulis, slightly higher to 3.3 to 4.5 established plants for desis, and seeding at higher rates uh, may definitely increase the disease severity. Field rolling, if rolling is necessary, it should be done prior to crop emergence because of the erect growth habit and the stiff stems um, rolling after the crop emerges can cause damage, uh, resulting in more uh, sites for, for fungal infections. Intercropping, I'm just going to mention that research trials with flax have shown advantages uh, in terms of decreased ascochyta, reduced lodging, and um, yield stability as well. Um, but there's going to be a presentation on that here in, in just a bit. So um, I'm going to leave that there. Regarding cultivars, um, Kabuli chickpeas are slightly more susceptible to ascochyta than desis. Uh, young plants are moderately resistant, but resistance declines at flowering. Uh, when, basically going to get you to concentrate on the ascochyta blight resistance column, uh, nine being 
completely susceptible, one being uh, completely resistant or, or highly resistant. Uh, you can see that they are uh, uh, on the on the susceptible side. The Desi's being slightly slightly more more resistant. And as well, there's going to be a presentation on on cultivars here in in just a bit. So I think right after my presentation. So um, uh, we'll leave that there as well. In terms of seed treatment, have your seed tested. Plant only seed with less than or equal to 0.3% ascochyta infections. Um, apply fungicide seed treatments. And again, for a seed treatment to be effective, make sure that you get good coverage and proper rates are used. And also uh, something that we always need to keep in mind is ensure compatibility with inoculants that are used on the crop. We've got a list of seed treatments that are registered for control or suppression of ascochyta. And uh, this list is also on the South Pulse website. <clears throat> this table as well is taken from the South Pulse website, action thresholds and, and registered seed treatment options. Um, just basically point out again, uh, make sure that you're planting ascochyta free seed or, or very low infections. Uh, greater than 0 0.3, do not use that seed. Uh, in terms of botrytis, um, Fusarium and sclerotinia should be less than 10%. Use seed treatments and also use seed treatments if you've got a history of, of um, pythium and, and different soil borne diseases or if the session or season is under cool, moist conditions. <clears throat> Scouting, I think this is the key. Uh, early app identification of ascochyta is very important. Scout each field individually. Scouting should start at the seedling stage. Check five to 10 sites in the field. Uh, don't just do the scouting from the road in a W or a large circular shape. Pay attention to low or wet areas. Have your crop canopy, headlands, or da damaged plants. Use pin flags or GPS to mark areas of the field. Take photos. And as well, get out there and use a small spade. Remove plants for close inspections. Check root health as well as nodulation. Checking should occur every three to seven days during the seedling stage. After a fungicide application, scout for sure within seven days to reevaluate disease severity. And if you didn't apply a fungicide, scout again within three to five days for a reassessment. And scouting should be continued until at least the pod filling stage. And as always, under cool or under wet, uh, warm conditions, uh, scout more often. Fungicide application. Fungicides control disease by providing a protective barrier. Some fungicides have limited curative abilities. It's best to use fungicides in a preventative manner for effective ascochyta control. Some fungicides have systemic properties. They're able to move uh, through the plant uh, in the xylem and the direction of movement is usually upward and outward. <clears throat> Some fungicides are contact only, and those are the group M's, and they will not penetrate the, the plant. Uh, differences in, the, in levels of systemic activity between active ingredients within the same group, for example, the strobirulins, um, is oxostrobin in Lattice and Mirabus. Neo is highly systemic, whereas the trifloxystrobin in Delaro is, is, is somewhat less. Um, <clears throat> Foliar fungicides last about 10 to 14 days within the plant, shortened under good growing conditions or when a highly susceptible variety is grown. Here's a list um, of registered fungicides for control or suppression of ascochyta. And um, got the groups listed there as well. Miravis Neo, group 11, seven and three. Preoxer is 11 and seven. Diax 11 and seven. These are in no particular order. Um, so you can see the groups that are, or the, the fungicides that have the two groups, as well as the single groups, and then the Bravo Echo, the M5. Headline is only a group 11 and should not be applied alone. Um, mix, mix that with Lance. Fungicide application, continuing with, with the control. First application should be applied at the 7 to 10 node stage um, <clears throat> or Earliest staging if conditions for disease are present. If required, the second application should be made 
um, to protect the flowers and, and maybe even more. Um, then make decisions on subsequent applications based on weather, um, <clears throat> disease progression, and crop stage. Coverage is critical for performance. Um, minimum of 10 to 12 gallons per acre for first application. And as the canopy thickens, consider higher water volumes. Drier years may be able to get away with uh, two applications, but under normal conditions or wetter years, four to five applications may be necessary to manage astrochyta blight. There's a great uh, for uh, fungicide decision support list, uh, checklist for chickpeas on the SAS Pulse website. And uh, that's a tool that can be used to, to help make that uh, fungicide decision. Fungicide resistance management. Um, never use a strobe alone. Um, one of the main, it's, it's one of the main groups that was used for aspicite of light uh, control in chickpeas. Was was vastly overused for many years. And in 2007, it was found that almost the entire Ascochyta population was resistant or insensitive to strobes. In recent years with more fungicide options and reduced use, it is thought that uh, uh, the overall resistance of, of Ascochyta, the population has dropped and uh, believe that stro strobelians currently provide somewhat effective control on some isolates in the population. As a result, uh, never use a group 11 alone and uh, also make sure you use proper fungicide stewardship even with the other groups for ascochyta management. Uh, use a strobe early in the season. Uh, one of the main reasons is because of the greening effect and uh, with uh, chickpeas having a long growing season, uh, this can exacerbate that, that problem as well. Also, if you do have uh, ascochyta um, pathogens which uh, escape the the group 11 and, and maybe the first one or two apps, um, you have a chance to uh, control them and make sure that they don't uh, um, make it through the winter. Just use tank mix is We have five minutes left. <laughs> okay, use tank mix is controlling multiple modes of action. Don't cut rates and do not apply the same group more than two times on the same field in one season, except for chlorothanol, uh, which can be applied three times. Um, groups available, uh, which I'm sure we mostly know, is groups 3, 7, 11, and M, and the group M's uh, if a fungicide is needed for, for crop protection. When not to spray, <clears throat> not past the first week of August. If disease control was ineffective and numerous lesions exist on pods, um, if severe hail or other injury occurs at potting, a fungicide application probably will not be effective to protect the plant against new disease. If estimated yield loss is less than the cost of a fungicide, don't apply fungicide. And I know that can be really easy to say and a lot more difficult to determine out in the field. Um, lots of scouting. Typical chickpea fungicide rotations within a season. Um, just examples, Miravis Neo on a dry year, that, that's one option. Uh, something with, with two groups for sure, and uh, possibly then uh, Proline or Lance, <clears throat> WDG, and maybe a app application of Bravo just to uh, protect the pods. On a wet year, it gets more complicated. Um, I've got Diaxin Dolero here, but um, if, if you need two applications of a group 11, make sure that they've got uh, something else uh, mixed in there as well. Uh, possibly Proline or Lance, and, uh, and then one or two applications of Bravo, and, and possibly one or two more. Um, it can get really complicated on wet years, as as you guys know. Just a couple of uh, <clears throat> slides here on biosimilants and biologicals. A company called Itopolina, a global company based in the U.S., to produce a product called Stimtide. Uh, consisting of mixtures of peptides and amino acids and according to their research has been shown to among other um, effects uh, control uh, abiotic stress uh, produced by weather disease and, and herbicide applications um, through four years of data um, they have shown a 7.2 bushel per acre increase in soybeans and uh, more recent research is being done um, 
something that uh, I, I think this this uh, agriculture will be moving in this direction. I think there's some a lot of upside here, and and may hopefully some more uh, tools that uh, will be provided for for producers to use in the control of of, of diseases. <clears throat> Biostimulants, uh, another thing that these this company has been doing is they've they've isolated some uh, strains of bacteria. And I'd just like you to focus on the last column. Um, five or of these seven strains have shown some antifungal or antibacterial activity. And uh, so I guess stay tuned. Hopefully uh, something occurs here uh, out, of, out of this research. Uh, another uh, product, Defender, um, by, uh, sponsored by EarthSmart, um, has been out there with mixed reviews. I've had some producers uh, have really good good luck with it and have reduced their uh, fungicide application. I guess the, the big thing to remember with these is uh, buyer beware, make sure that you do your research, make sure that you apply these, that you continue scouting and, and make sure that uh, you don't get uh, uh, caught with uh, serious disease issues. And with that, um, I think if there's any questions in the chat box, we'll address them later. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, Ken and Sherlyn, that was good. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bunyaman Tan from the Crop Development Center. Bunyaman is a professor, a chickpea breeder, and an intern leader in the flax breeding at CDC. He has a master's and a PhD from the University of Guelph, and his major research is genetic improvement and variety development of chickpeas. Today, he's going to share some info on current chickpea varieties and what is coming down the pipeline. Thanks for joining us, Bunyaman. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Brett, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, to SPG for organizing this event and for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, kind of uh, share what we are doing on the breeding side of chickpeas. So my name is Bunyamin Tarang, and I hope everybody can hear me well. If not, please send me a note so that I can fix it right away. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the data from uh, crop insurance, where we are in terms of the acreage uh, in, from 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. You can see there's an increased trend in starting 2018 and 19 because of the good price for chickpeas, and uh, a little bit down in 2020, and we'll see what happened in 2021 this year. So you can see at the uh, graph here, the slice, uh, the pie uh, graph here. This is from the insured acreage from the crop insurance. You can see the changing from 2018, 2019, and 2020. So basically, the most common varieties that you grew here in Saskatchewan and Western Canada are two varieties, Orion and Leader. Okay, there's still uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, Frontier and B90 grown in the province. And uh, in the past uh, three years, you can see Orion and Leader kind of uh, almost similar, equal acreage. But then in 2020, uh, Leader is, uh, uh, seems to get more acreage because of the problem with the Orion that you see in 2019. This is the areas where uh, mostly uh, where chickpea were grown in the province. So mostly basically south uh, part of the province and south uh, uh, west of the province. So this is where uh, can wall kind of area. So thank you, Ken, for introduction of the disease and management. So this is the area. And then this is the, the breeding site where we do our selection. So we are located in Saskatoon, and we have uh, major nurseries in Alrose, Lucky Lake, Moose Jaw, and Limerick up to 2019, 2020. We reduce uh, the site due to COVID restrictions. So uh, having said that, kind of uh, our staff uh, did a good job and be able to see it and harvest our trials and with the good data at the end. So this is again just to remind you what we are, what the goals of our breeding program at CDC. So number one is uh, to to bring competitive advantage for you as farmers. So of course the number one is the bushel, the yield. And in chickpea in particular, especially the Kabuli type, is the seed size. So we try to, to get that uh, uh, 
uh, kind of uh, bring that premium to you. So, and then of course uh, by price. So price is kind of beyond my controls. At least they're the first two things that I can control through biology, through genetics and breeding. And then the second one is to reduce the risk and minimize production costs. So this included uh, ascochyta blight resistance, uh, early maturity, do, uh, we do some screening, and also abiotic stress tolerance, such as uh, we are working on looking at the heat tolerance in chickpeas, uh, because uh, especially when there is flowering, during the flowering, when the temperature heat uh 27 degrees celsius that kind of the threshold and we start to see some abortion on the flowers of chickpeas so we are uh, looking into that and making selection on that and then ease of management plant stature so in general chickpeas more upright and more lodging tolerance than any other uh, pulses so that's a good thing we continue that and also we uh, selecting for herbicide tolerance. So we're not doing any GM or any other method, but we look into what is available in the germplasm little by little, and we incorporate that into uh, the breeding program. So you see uh, the changes we have now. Uh, the, all the newer varieties will have uh, tolerance to uh, IMI type of herbicide. And then the seed quality. So beside the visual, characteristic of the seeds such as size, color, and shape. We're also looking into the some of the kind of uh, uh, cooking quality, nutritional quality as well. So how the canning quality of the chickpeas and in Desi, how the milling quality, how much you get after you mill uh, the product because of the Desi mostly consumed as a flour uh, mixer to make a bread. Okay, so this is the the kind of gain that you see uh, from the chickpea. So you can see that's up and down, but if you look at the overall from 2005, 2019, uh, at, at the farm level, you can see the gain on average about 26 pounds per acre per year. So this is kind of a combination of the genetics and the agronomy of uh, the crop that you grow. So good manage. So in our trials, we, of course, we have much higher yield than this. So there's still gap between what you see here, although you see some gain, but there's still gap from what we see in our trials and what you get from your field. So that's kind of where the agronomy, crop management, disease management, and, and, and weed management site selection will play a role. How to maximize your yield kind of a closer or at least in between to what we get. For example, in our case, we can get up to on average three, uh, uh, tons per hectare. Okay, so this is the the uh, variety of uh, green crops, your uh, variety guide from the provincial government that we updated every year. So this is kind of long-term average data that we publish here from, from uh, year to year. So you can see here uh, the numbers that you see, uh, area one, area two, and then the disease score. Uh, uh, can already mention some part of this. Again, okay, and then seed size, yes, uh, as a 1,000 uh, uh, seed weight, and also seed shape. And if you notice on the last column here, okay, in the last uh, three years or so, you see there's an additional column for chickpeas where now the product, uh, the solo or imazamux type of uh, herbicides now register for chickpeas. Okay, so, so you see on the older varieties, there are two varieties that are already tolerant, but all the newer varieties that come into the uh, market will have tolerance to this. So we kind of uh, uh, gradually this, uh, the number of lines that we say yes on the last column here will be increasing. This is just the data from the last two years of those varieties in our so-called uh, variety uh, regional tests, a uh, chickpea regional test across the province. So normally we did the test around eight to 10 sites or 10 locations, eight in Saskatchewan and two in Alberta. So up to 2019. In 2020, we reduced to four because of the COVID restriction. So this is the data I want to show you what we get from our those uh, 
location in our regional trial. So you can see here uh, of the entries that are grown in, uh, in, in the province, for example, Frontier, B90, Leader and Orion. You can see Orion is kind of really down in 2020 across the four locations that we did our trials. Okay, so some many factors, some disease and dry in, in some in some locations. Okay, and also there's an increasing uh, score in our plots of for the Aspokaita. So when we did the score, we did a score kind of uh, at the late. Uh, kind of stage, which is at the podding, early podding, late flowering, early podding stage. That's when we did the score. So the score here is done or based on the, the scoring at the podding stage of the crop. Just a okay, reminder, so Brian, the, we have two minutes left. Two minutes, okay. I'll do quick. Okay, so this is the, the new varieties that are coming into the market. Okay, CDC Lancer. CDC Orkney, 2019-2020 uh, release. Okay, you see the yield potential in 2019 and 2020 average, the seed size. And in 2021, we have this four potential, uh, two cabulis, one is small cabulis that is good for the kind of processing for hummus market or maybe uh, a dog food, if you will. And then 3652 is uh, the largest uh, cabuli that are available. And then one daisy uh, to 510, which is with the light 10 seed coat color, which is very appealing for the market, whole seed market for the daisy. And then also one specialty daisy, uh, black daisy, uh, with good for Ascoquita. And this last one is kind of really the special one, which, uh, which has uh, uh, the earliest maturing variety. So I just show you some picture. This is 2020 release. You see Orkney plot was in Musjo, taken in August 11, okay? So yield about 105 of Amit or B90, 386 per thousand seeds, similar to Leader. Asko Kaita about 4.9, better than Leader and Palmer. And this is the uh, small Kabuli, 104% uh, of Amit from 2019, 2020, 327 per thousand seeds, and Asko Kaita around 4.8, this is earlier maturity than, than B90 or Amit. And this is the, the large Kabuli, okay, so uh, about 476. So this is the largest uh, Kabuli type that is available now, okay, about 90% uh, of B90, 86, 90%. So there's a bit of, of a yield penalty there, and as you create around five. And this is the daisy type uh, grown in Limerick. Okay, this is taken on August 14, 2020. Okay, about 103% of Amit or B90, seed weight 2091. You can see the seed color here, uh, light 10 uh, seed color, as I said, is uh, one of the characteristic uh, looking at uh, desirable for the Desi whole seed market. And this is the black seeded Desi, okay, very early, one of the least maturing varieties. So, so uh, all of these are, are uh, tolerance to EMI herbicide. So this is on August 14, the same day that I take the other day, I took the picture as the other daisy, but this one already kind of done almost. Uh, similar uh, yield with B90. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank our staff and source for, for the breeding program. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Bunyman for his update. I know the board at SAS Paul Scores is glad they are in and we we support his first class breeding program. Next, I'd like to introduce Lana Shaw. She's the manager of Southeast Research Farm. It's a nonprofit farmer directed research center. Lana's got a master's and bachelor's degree from the U of S and has worked in agronomy for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Today, she's gonna to share her research and the many benefits of intercropping chickpeas and flax. Welcome, Lana. Thanks. Um, I'm glad you could join us on this cold day when it's not nice to do other things outside today. Um, so I've been working with chickpea flax intercropping since 2012. And there's a few pictures there on the main slide. There, we're gonna cover things like disease and um, crop, um, the crop separation and what the, the harvested grain looks like. So this is what I do. I do fairly large scale agronomic plots. There's me, um, Shell Hubbard is here, Bill May is here. We, we're collaborating on this 
uh, multi-site project. This is our location. This is what the trial will look like. There's side-by-side -side plots of monocrop chickpeas here. This is the chickpea flax. And there's a big maturity difference, big disease difference. Those are the kind of things that, that we're pulling out. And sometimes I just sit there and look at these and try to figure out what these plants are trying to tell me about what works and what, is, what doesn't. So why are we talking about chickpea flax intercropping and who on earth came up with this? Intercropping, growing more than one grain crop simultaneously has been kind of a um, old farmer trick for decades. It's never been very popular. It was kind of fringe. There's been a little bit of research done on it in the 80s and 90s. And the the first person that we know of that had tried chickpea flax was Colin Rosengren, who took an idea of flax and lentils and said, well, maybe I'll try chickpeas. And in it actually worked. He figured out how you could make the combine thresh the flax bowls and without damaging the chickpeas. So um, what I'm trying to show you with this slide is the that there's an interconnection between the um, the research and the the farmers and it's sort of like a feedback loop thing where they we help validate what the farmers are seeing the the farmers information helps us design better research trials which then further allows more farmers to uptake the practice with some validation and instructions from the farmers on how to actually accomplish this because it's it's uh, this is not a minor change this is a, a really different production system so i'm listing a few of the researchers that are currently involved in projects i've called around and tried to gather my contacts on on the chickpea flax thing because i've worked in this since 2012 i've had contact with a lot of people that are doing this so this is not saskatchewan crop insurance acres this is the acres that i know of and saskatchewan crop insurance acres are lower than these acres because uh, a lot of people either aren't using crop insurance or they're not reporting properly so what we're, we're we saw there was a big upswing in chickpea acres in total, of course, but also chickpea flax intercropping in 2017, 2018, and going into 2019. That was brought on by the high chickpea prices. And that's on a downswing now for, for chickpea monocrops and intercrops, but we'll see how the how it holds up. So there's about a dozen farmers that I know of or a bit more who have been doing this every year. And that does not mean I've contacted everyone. These are just the, the, the ones that I know of. Gives you an idea of what's happening there. So there's a research trials. There's been a few research trials going on over the last few years that have looked at the chickpea flax intercrop. So comparing that to a monoculture of chickpeas and then adding increasing amounts of flax to see what effect that's having. That's one of the factors we're looking at. We're also, we also are looking at nitrogen and looking at mixed versus alternating rows. Those have not had much of an effect on the, on the growth and effectiveness of this intercrop. The flax seeding rate really does. And you can see here, these, these two where the monocrops are doing really, really well are from red versus Indian head. Those are bumper chickpea crops, but realistically, these are not places that we can grow monocrop chickpeas reliably. We'll either have a bumper crop that's really bad quality, usually, or a disease wreck that doesn't turn out at all. So this is kind of pie in the sky numbers there. More realistic is some of these. So sometimes we're seeing a, a, the chickpea or the gross revenue a little bit lower. Sometimes it's a bit higher. This um, five, I added in a $500 an acre line just to give you an idea of, of how profitable some of these are. So we're, a lot of the time they're still in a very profitable range. Depending on the relative price of chickpeas and flax, that obviously the gross value will vary. That's, this gross value does not take into the quality differences, take into account quality differences that happen usually when we're intercropping usually the intercrops have higher quality of the chickpea grain. 
So this was from the multi-site trial that's led by Mil Bill May out of Indian Head, and it's funded by Western Grains Research Foundation, Sask Flax, and the Agriculture Development Fund. Um, that, that started in 2019. In 2017, this trial was funded by Sask Pulse Growers. In 2018, it was kind of self-funded. Uh, what you can see here from those years, these were years when we did not have ideal fall conditions before harvest, where the chickpeas kind of hang on and hang on. The chickpeas do not know when to shut the party down sometimes. And so on this side is the our monocrops. That's so we're getting, you know, 13, 17% uh, not great seed, green seed or, or disease damage seed or some kind of not good seed. Um, as with all of these um, additions of flax from 75 to 150, 300 and 600 plants per square meter, we were getting a, an improvement in quality. Now, 150 is somewhere around 10 pounds an acre, depending on the seed size and whatnot. So it doesn't actually take very much flax to have an impact on chickpea quality. Now, chickpea disease is probably the biggest reason that people are adopting this complicated practice to deal with with disease in their chickpeas. So I've compiled results that are have comparable treatments across a number of different um, trials that have been done over a few years. These are the Saskatchewan trials. And I just looked at the 10 to 20 pounds per acre approximate um, seeding rates for the flax, because that's what we're recommending as a reasonable agronomic rate. And for those, this is the, the, uh, the monocrop is in blue, the endocrop is in orange. That's the kind of reductions that we're seeing. So sometimes when the disease is generally low, we're still getting an effect. Sometimes that's a really minimal effect. Um, so we've had those, there were statistically significant differences, even with only 10 foot by 20 foot long plots, we're still getting statistically significant differences in with a disease that spreads really easily. And that's almost surprising to get those sort of effects. Now, south of the border where they're also doing this intercropping from Williston in 2018, they had quite severe ascochyta. So this is just, really looking at ascochyta because the other diseases are don't show up as reliably. Uh, Williston had a big effect of intercropping. And, and then the Carrington sites, it's 2019, they did uh, with fungicide treatment and without. So the one with the star is the with fungicides. So when they didn't use any fungicides, they got a big drop in disease. When they did use fungicides, they still got an additional drop in disease from intercropping, which is really important. And now, unfortunately, in 2020, they didn't get the same effect again, but that's suggesting that there's um, there's something interesting here that we need to delve into more to figure out what are the additive effects of intercropping with using fungicide and can intercropping replace some of those fungicide treatments effectively. Now, I'm taking this little complicated bit of um, multi-site data and I've plotted it on an XY chart here. So um, this line, if, if they're below this line, that means that the intercrop is reducing disease. There's no site years that were above this line which means that intercropping never increased the amount of disease. When I talk about this with some people, they think, well, that would increase the humidity and the canopy for the chickpea, so it would increase the amount of disease in the chickpea, which we have never seen in any trials. There's statistically significant differences and, and it is in reducing disease. Do we know why this is happening? No, we don't know how it's happening. Uh, but it does seem to be related to the amount of flax. So the more flax you have, the less disease there is. However, you also get less chickpeas. So there is there is a balance. There were situations where there was no difference, but that was generally in, in situations where the disease was really patchy in the plots or the disease was really low. 
So to uh, an additional source of this information is the the Askokaita blight surveys that Michelle Hubbard has been doing in charge of the last two years. And she sent me slides from the 2020 survey. There was a 2019 survey and I haven't included that data. It, it was similar. So it's looking at a number of different things, but we'll concentrate on the intercrop versus monocrop for this. So they sampled commercial chickpea fields across the province, including in traditional chickpea production areas. They didn't have paired sites generally where there was an intercrop field right beside a, a monocrop field. So it's just whatever happened to be out in the countryside. And this is what they found. There was lower disease in the intercrops, even though they used less fungicide. So it wasn't just that they skipped doing fungicide and let the disease run rampant. There was still less disease, even though they were using less fungicide. The, they weren't using no fungicide. Um, there, there is 0.5 is the average. So some were using one and some were using zero. And there's probably a few that were using two. But that's what that's what this data set is is showing. And there were statistically significant differences there. And Michelle Hubbard is the source for this. So if you want more information, you can check with her. Uh, conclusions from various trials that have been done by me and Bill May and Michelle Hubbard and a few other people over the last seven years. Uh, when you increase the amount of flaxseed, you also are lowering the amount of chickpeas you will get in the balance. You get more flax, but less chickpeas. You're going to get less total uh, generally when the flax rate is too high. Um, so the chickpea, a lot of chickpea grain goes down, but you're adding in a flax component. So the gross crop value is comparable to the monocrop. Now that can be quite a lot higher um, under some conditions, but under some conditions it can be lower. When you factor in the savings on fungicide, that makes this attractive to people. So when you increase the amount of flax seed, you get less chickpea disease. So there is a balance. So there's green seed. So maturity is affected by intercropping, particularly in those years when there's moisture and any available nitrogen to the chickpea crop as it's maturing. And anyone that's grown chickpeas for a while knows how chickpeas react when there's some fall moisture. So it's not a fail safe. I have had it where the intercropping did not bring them in well enough but the monocrops were a lot worse. So I think of flax as a buddy crop it tells the chickpeas when it's time to pack it in, the party is over and it is time to go. So it helps them ripen on time. You can see here there's a little green seed here so it's not it's not a complete fail safe, nothing is. 2020 was a miserable year for trying to grow chickpeas but um, this is David Kucher from Tindersley, who's on Twitter lots. And this is an interesting option for that part of the world that's currently struggling with their lentils because of phantomyces. So how do you harvest that? I've been told so many times by people that there's no possible way you can harvest that. And I obviously don't know anything about combines. That may be true. I don't really know anything about combines, but I know a lot of farmers who do. And they're doing this on the scale of thousands of acres. So what one of the first steps to make sure you can harvest it is at seeding, you have to make sure you have enough chickpeas relative to the flax. You do not go full bore flax on this, uh, 10 to 20 pounds in it. If you're worried about it, 10 to 15. So you make sure you have a good high rate of chickpeas relative to the flax. Why? Because the flax is going to get threshed by the chickpea bowls when it's going through the combine. That's how this works. So imagine a bunch of ball bearings going through your combine. At maturity, you desiccate if you need to, to dry down that flax straw. And um, you set the combine for the chickpeas and turn down the, the, the wind so that you don't blow out the flax. There's some more minor settings. If you need 
people that need more information, you go talk to other farmers about this because I am no good with the insides of combines. <clears throat> so ideally, it looks something like this. It's not full of flax bowls. You don't have to separate all the flax bowls and rethresh them if things go well. There are I have seen situations where people end up separating out some percentage of flax bowls and then rethreshing them, but that's not that's a plan B. And how are they separating them? Usually with a, some kind of a rotary screen type operation after harvest. So you're not having two combine operations, you're having one combine operation and a separation. So here's your key takeaways. This is another tool in your disease toolbox. And you know, we're we have a lot of pressure on the genetics, and we have a lot of pressure right now on the on the fungicides to maintain a healthy chickpea crop. This is another thing that will help take the pressure off of those existing tools so that maybe they'll last longer, maybe, maybe that they'll work better. There's an interesting possibility of growing this in lentil country where they're currently struggling with, with um, a panamyces root rot. And the reason I'm saying that this is that the main thing that's keeping it out of some of these areas of the dark brown soil zone in lentil country is that they don't mature quite reliably enough and there's a little bit too much disease pressure. By intercropping, you've reduced both of those. So it effectively seems to be making the chickpeas more adapted to a larger area of the province. There, there is a limit to that, of course. Like Redbers is really getting to the limit of where you can feasibly grow this, but it's also a really good test site for testing that idea. As is Indian head, that's not traditional chickpea country. So if you want to try this, um, the starting guardrails, this is my guardrails, say hi on the chickpeas and go 10 to 20 pounds an acre of flax. Play in between there try varying the rate a little bit and see how it turns out but if you want it to if you want to not have to make powder out of your chickpeas to thresh the flax don't go too high on the flax you can pencil in fewer applications of fungicide but obviously you should be monitoring that and this is a crop that you want to protect so um, i usually or we're usually do, when we're doing trials putting one app application on at around flowering time in the, the chickpeas when the rows are closing in and then just monitoring it after that and you kind of let it ride. So, uh, and that's similar to what a lot of farmers are doing unless it's wet and then they might go twice. Uh, and connect with other farmers, particularly on Twitter. There's a hashtag there that, that can help connect you with other farmers that are doing intercropping that have some years of experience. Just so you know, Lana, so, five minutes left. Okay, so crop sequence, how do you, um, and some of the other agronomic information, you can use authority herbicide on both of these and a grass herbicide. So it's best to put this on a cereal stubble. Don't put this on canola stubble or mustard stubble. You, can, you have no way of cleaning out your brassica weeds and avoid fields that are bad for volunteer, any kind of brassicas or um, brassica weeds. And the intercrop stubble is is quite nice. It's not the same as, as a flax stubble that you really have to fight with. Separation, here's a quick clean. There's a different kind of rotary screen thing. These are relatively cheap and available to do on farm. And it just involves a lot of augers and trucks going every which way in the yard. That's generally done on farm. Um, I think I'm all right for time, so I'll run down some acknowledgements. These are some of the the like people that have been involved been involved besides me. Um, Bill May at, at Egg Canada in Indian Head and his technical staff, and Dr. Michelle Hubbard came on in 2017, and ha she's the pulse pathologist out of Swift Current, and she's been very very helpful at at raising the bar on our ability to to do disease work on this chickpea flax. And then we've got our staff at Red Rivers, of course. The, um, Dr. Mike Osley is the scientist out of NDSU Carrington. Dr. Claire Keene is the, the scientist out of Williston. And then the intercropping farmers, thank you for telling me your acreage. 
and just telling me what you, what you're doing. And this has been funded at various times by a few different organizations, including SAS Pulse Growers for a couple of years. And that, this is how to get a hold of me. So I've got our um, the website, the Twitter handle, which I'm on a lot, my email, my phone number. So if you actually want to try this, I am available to talk to talk you through some of the decisions that you need to make and answer questions. And uh, that's mostly it. I put in a few extra slides just in case I had time. Uh, there's another typical setup for the separation on farm. So there's a quick clean, there's trucks and augers, and so you end up needing a lot of augers usually and a few different bins. One of the um, issues with this is that you, you're going to need more bin space to be able to do all the separating. People are storing this on farm until after harvest. We don't have the parameters for how to do that safely because there's never been storage trials done. Um, there might be some in coming up, but it's the, the, the key is just to keep an eye on it, put some put some air through it and separate it when you have time. They, it seems to store quite well as long as both of those crops are, if you hand separate them or dry in their own right. Okay, that is all I have. Okay, thanks Lana. That's uh, nice, nice of you to share your experience. Our next presentation is Greg Bartley. He's from Pulse Canada. Greg is a bachelor's in ag and a master's in plant science at the University of Manitoba. As the Director of Crop Protection and Crop Quality of Pulse Canada, he works to ensure crop protection products in the global marketplace. Greg is also going to present on harvest management options, as well as market access issues from the products we use. Welcome, Greg. Perfect. Thanks, Brad. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Please uh, participate in this tricky seminar. Um, as Brad mentioned, this, this presentation is going to, going to be more on the lines of the, the market access side of things and some considerations as far as uh, what to think about, you know, as we choose our harvest management options and, and maybe what's coming down the line into the future of, of future considerations as well. So with that, uh, just briefly want to go over, um, you know, who we are at Pulse Canada. So Pulse Canada is a national commodity association that uh, represents both the growers and the traders and exporters, uh, exporters and processors of, of Pulse crops in Canada. So through the member organizations such as Saskatchewan Pulse Course, but also through the Canadian Special Crops Association, that is that organization that represents the, the exporters uh, of Pulse Crops. What we do at Pulse Canada really comes down to uh, one main area of work, and this is really just to, to contribute to the profitability of the Canadian Pulse industry. You know, that, that's our main focus and what we do every day to, to strive towards that. We split that into two different files, although there's much more that goes on at Pulse Canada, but it can be uh, split into the, the corporate affairs. And this is really getting into that market access and, and making sure that we, we resolve any market access issues, but also take a proactive approach to, to, to stay ahead of them, you know, try to foresee them before they come and, and make sure they just don't happen. So this is transportation, this is um, any, any issues as far as uh, sanitary or phytosanitary issues, MRLs, things like that. The other side is, is market innovation, and this is really to build uh, demand. So build new and sustainable demand for Canadian pulses. Make sure we're not reliant on a couple large markets. Try and diversify into many different markets as, as that is beneficial for the long-term sustainability of the pulse industry. If we took a, take a look at the global pulse industry and, and where Canada fits in, when it comes to top pulse producers, we know that India is by far the, the greatest producer of pulse crops. Um, however, Canada is fairly close as well. We uh, produce about 10% of the, the global pulse production, so, so we, do, we are fairly, fairly high in that. However, when we look at pulse exports, Canada is by far the greatest exporter of pulse crops, supplying about a third of the, the pulses into that global marketplace. However, if we look at the, the chickpea industry, though, that's our topic for today, uh, things are maybe a little bit different. Uh, when we look at the top 10 chickpea producers, and this is averaged from 2015 to 19, so it can fluctuate a bit year to year. But again, India is by far the greatest chickpea uh, producer. But um, when you look in the top 10, Canada doesn't make the list when it's averaged over, over multiple years. However, we're, we're fairly close to into that list. When we look at exports though, uh, we are still fairly high up there. So Australia is by far the greatest exporter of chickpeas into the global marketplace. They are, are quite a large uh, chickpea producer. 
Um, but we are, you know, on the list down to about the fifth or sixth, uh, fourth or fifth uh, exporter of chickpeas. So if you compare that to, say, chickpea producers, uh, where we really aren't in the top 10, but, you know, we really jump up in exporters, it's really showing that, you know, how reliant we are on export markets for our pulse production. And just the vast majority of our, our chickpea acres are exported. So it's really important. Just breaking down our top 10 chickpea export markets. Uh, this is for, for the previous grain year, so 2019 20 grain year. Um, you know, Pakistan uh, is our, or was our greatest uh, export market in that year. Um, however, the United States is, is there as well. You know, it's a fairly, fairly high. So this is encouraging when, when we do have, let's say, domestic or, or North American markets. Uh, I would consider these to be a bit more stable. And it's, it's nice to see that we have this domestic. Um, uh, the domestic uh, focus on, on some of our, our exports of chickpeas. And this is things like where, where hummus is such a, a large uh, staple in many households now. It's really driving into that market and other, other uses. When you look at the other markets, uh, again, it definitely breaks down when you get into the top 10. You know, they get smaller and smaller, but I think it's just uh, showing that there's many small different markets, but they all add up. Uh, example of this is, is the European Union. You know, when you break down the EU into little different markets, it, it really doesn't, uh, it's not a whole lot uh, individualized. When you bring the EU together as a block, uh, they're about our fourth largest market. So it's, it's definitely significant. And finally, just driving the point home that, you know, we are export reliant. You know, 85% of our pulse crops are exported. Uh, for chickpeas, I imagine the statistic is fairly similar. And we export to over 120 different countries. Again, maybe not all for chickpeas. Fees. Now, when we look at uh, the trade uncertainty that's maybe going on right now, uh, we do we do have a lot of uncertainty. You know, there are issues that do pop up and continue to pop up as as we navigate uh, what's going on right now. So, trade issues continue to evolve. Uh, this includes uh, things like crop protection products and maximum residue limits. And I'll be diving into this later in the presentation. Uh, there are WC requirements in export markets. You can expand this, expand this on to, to plant disease issues and things like this. You know, there's, there's many different things that could fall under a sanitary and phytosanitary issue. Uh, we all know about the quantitative restrictions. Uh, these are still ongoing and, and you know, seeing India um, adjust their, their quantitative restrictions and even their tariffs uh, just creates this uncertainty. And I'd say we're operating in a protectionist environment. Um, you know, countries are really looking inwards. And I think with this COVID-19 pandemic, that, that may be more true in some instances as well where you know, it's, it's really an inward focus to, to maintain the, the, their own use of, or maintain the country's own, own needs. So maximum residue limit, maximum residue limit. Um, just wanna really quickly define this to make sure that everyone understands what an MRL is. Um, so an MRL represents the maximum amount of pesticide residues that are expected to remain on a food product when the pesticide is used according to label directions. So it's really important to, to understand that you know, MRLs are based on, on label directions. So it's really the maximum use pattern. So the, the, the shortest pre-harvest interval, maximum number of applications. Um, this is what you use to base that MRL. And then within that maximum residue that can be expected, there's usually a, a, a area of um, kind of a grace period as well. So you add about 10% about on what that maximum would be in the field trials. And that's what your MRL is. So again, based on those label directions, um, it's not a measure of food safety. It's used primarily for trade purposes. Again, just to give an indication that the product was used correctly. However, the kicker here is that uh, Canadian crops or any crop in, you know, that's being exported must meet the MRL set by the destination country in order to avoid trade disruptions. So even though we establish our MRLs here in Canada, that's what we need to legally abide by here in Canada, we really do have to pay attention to the MRLs in export markets. And this is really shifting, and, and I'll explain this a bit more. As far as food safety, I just want to touch on real quickly, you know, MRL definitely falls on the low end. So again, it's not a food safety measure. Um, there is a quite a, a difference in, in uh, variance as far as where we do see those, those food safety issues. And again, MRLs are set sometimes 100 times lower than, than those levels where we see the food safety issues. So uh, important to, to keep in mind as we talk about MRLs. Uh, when we look at emeralds in the global marketplace, I'd say the trading environment um, has shifted. Uh, I think we we always used to refer to this as is shifting, but it's definitely shifted. Um, things that are contributing to, to more emerald problems or why this is becoming more of a, a topic of the day is um, many different factors. So so the first one is differing, differing emerald policies and export markets. Um, if you look at this figure here, it's, it kind of breaks down the different options as far as how countries view emeralds. So for example, in Canada, we maintain our own national MRL list. Uh, we establish our own MRLs and, and that's what we have. So it's a national list. 
However, other countries may have their own list as well, so national list, but then they could defer to uh, the international standards of Codex, um, you know, to, to body that, that comes together and establishes MRLs for the global marketplace. And some of these markets have their own national list, and if the MRL is missing, then they defer to Codex. You know, it's a really good situation to, to ensure that you're not missing an MRL as a fallback onto that international standard. Some countries don't have a national list, they just defer to Codex and just rely on that. A lot of smaller countries do that, and, you know, that's a good option. Um, or there's, there's deferrals as well. So let's say they have their own national list. If they don't have an MRL, they defer to Codex. If there's no MRL Codex, then they defer to EU, US. Again, just policies in place to make sure that uh, an MRL is established. And, and that's really good. That's what we like to see. When countries only have a national list and don't defer to anything else, that's when we have problems uh, in the cases of missing or misaligned MRL. We're seeing heightened monitoring and testing of residues. Um, it's really, it started to become cheaper to test for, for residues. And I think the, the sensitivity of these tests has been increasing as well. So a lot more countries are getting into it. Uh, they have the capacity to test for now. And it's why we need to pay a little more attention to, to, to our export markets, uh, maybe where we didn't in the past. So it's, it's important to, to stay on top of this and, and look to see where the monitoring is happening and make sure that we're meeting those requirements. Uh, default MRL policies is, is important to, uh, just to highlight. Um, so a default, policy is in the case where an MRL is not established, so there's no MRL in that, that, that market, you know, what do they do? Do they def, def, default to a, a certain level? So for example, in Canada, our default MRL policy is 0 0.1 parts per million. So if an MRL is not established, it's 0 0.01 that they would test for. In the, in the EU, for example, uh, their default MRL policy is 10 times lower than ours. It's 0 0.01, you know, vastly different. And these are all things to take into consideration when we're reviewing MRLs and maybe we don't have an MRL in place. You know, what is that default? What type of level of sensitivity do we, of data do we have to, to look back on? And uh, do we know if we're going to meet that or not based on that default MRL policy? Uh, the precautionary principle is an interesting one. Um, typically, the precautionary principle is maybe applied to uh, things like uh, GMO products, whereas, uh, you know, a few, quite a, quite a few years ago, maybe it's just a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the print, the precautionary principle used to, in the case where you're just not sure what those long-term risks are, so you, you tend to take a restrictive approach. We are seeing this being applied to crop protection products more and more, which is, is quite concerning. You know, I think there's there's more studies happening uh, that countries are, are wanting to look at or investigate further. And, you know, as I'd say that the European Union is one that's really been driving the precautionary principle in a lot of their policies, but again, it's spreading to other export markets. Um, for example, Mexico is, is a market that's, that's recently taken this approach and uh, it's getting into their, some of their policies as well. So it's something to keep an eye on. And finally, uh, the last one is really increased sensitivity towards pesticides and residues. You know, I think glyphosate's a really a, a key one here that, that everyone's aware of, just the sensitivity around it. But again, it, it's residues in general. Uh, it, it's, it's important to, to recognize what the, the end users are requesting and those end users are consumers. So that does unfortunately drive into a lot of decisions that are happening and maybe some of the policies where they shouldn't be. So uh, something to keep in mind. So I touched on the e, uh, the European Union. I just want to take a, a quick moment to, to maybe just give everyone, update everyone where the EU is at as far as the crop protection policy directions and maybe where we're seeing things go uh, into the future. So. Uh, the EU, um, under the Green Deal that they've announced quite a while ago, um, so, so the EU Green Deal is, is, a, is a plan to, to make the EU carbon neutral by 2050. So under the EU Green Deal, there's, there's multiple different policies are, uh, in place or, or proposed. And last year, the EU announced their farm to fork strategy and biodiversity strategy. Again, this is just a policy that sets direction. It's not a policy that's set in place or these are the, the things that are, are coming are, are actually uh, law it's really setting the direction. So the farm to fork strategy, there's some things in there that uh, may be a little concerning as far as that direction. Uh, obviously the, the crop protection side of things, it's, it's the, the direction uh, for 50% reduction of the use and risk of pesticides. So think of in your own farm, um, reducing your pesticide use by 50% and what that might uh, look like. Um, so this is where the EU is going. Uh, again, it's, it's strictly use. Um, I think what we'd like to see if, if we're looking at you know, reduction, uh, it'd be nicer to see, you know, reduce the, the impact of pesticides, you know, focus on the outcomes rather than the strict reduction, but this is the policy direction. So, so they're trying to reduce their use. There's other things like 20% reduction in the use of fertilizers, increased agriculture, uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets over 50% and 25% of agriculture land to be used in organic farming. So 
high level targets that they're working towards developing uh, legislation to, to help meet. So that's the direction. The biodiversity strategy, uh, much the same. Uh, something to highlight here within the 2050 vision is, is actually there's this last piece of, of global contribution. I think this is important to, to highlight here is that even though this is the EU crop protection policy direction, uh, we're seeing signs that the EU is, is, is not just trying to develop the policy for, for the EU. You know, I think there's clear indication that they're trying to bring everyone with them. So how can they influence uh, crops coming or uh, product coming into their country or, or the, the, in the EU? And, and what implications that would be. So it's not just EU policy direction. I think there's a push to, to bring everyone along with them. So what's the implications of Canadian agriculture? Um, there's a few things going on right now, and I just want to highlight kind of what we're seeing right now and maybe future impacts into the future as we continue to navigate this. So first off, the EU has um, a hazard-based criteria for the re renewal of crop protection products. Uh, this has in place, been in place for, for quite a few years now. Um, and this is essentially saying that um, non-renewal there's going to be a non-renewal an automatic non-renewable crop protection product if it triggers any of this hazard criteria um so there's a there's a few different categories that would fit that um but if it doesn't trigger that hazard criteria um, i'd say there's increased requirements uh, for the renewal of crop protection products so there's further studies needed uh taking a more scrut uh, a scrutiny towards the renewal of crop protection products and what we're seeing is it's really not inviting um policy or inviting inviting environment uh, for the renewal of crop protection products and we're starting to see uh, crop protection products just not renewed uh, in general so the reason why that's a problem is that if a crop protection product is not renewed uh, it has the potential for the MRL to be revoked two years after it's not renewed unless an import tolerance is, is uh, put into place in some cases it's not um, possible to get an import tolerance uh, applied so what we're seeing is MRLs uh, being removed now, as I mentioned earlier, when MRLs are removed, uh, that impacts us because then we have to meet those new MRL requirements, and it's that default MRL policy of W.01. So the most recent EU MRL revocations uh, that are, are relevant to the pulse crops is the chlorophyll uh, MRL. So this was announced a few months ago, and, and it's, it's set to be revoked to August 2021. And also clethodim. Clethodim has uh, been, been revoked as well, and it's uh, going to fall down to that default of, of October. Uh, 0.01 of, of October 2021. Again, I'm not saying this is going to cause concern for pulse uh, for our pulse crops. I think it, I'm just highlighting here that you know this is what's happening, and you know we're we're trying to take a close look to see um, if it's going to cause problems and and what potential that might be into the future. The next one to keep an eye on that we're we're trying to keep a close eye on or anticipating uh, into the future is, is the glyphosate. So glyphosate is going to be coming up for renewal in, in 2022, and it's really interesting to see how the EU approaches this one, uh, knowing that the the previous renewal was was quite controversial, and um, you know just trying thinking ahead of what the potential implications would be if it was not renewed. Uh, so something to think ahead about those potentials to come. And finally, the EU policy direction and other export markets. So as I mentioned, it's not just an EU uh, situation. Um, I think other countries are looking to the EU and, and that direction may be falling as well. So we've already seen this in, in pesticide bans announced by Vietnam, Thailand, India, and Mexico, as I mentioned. Um, so other countries are you know, taking this, this restrictive approach as well. And I think that, that may be a greater concern than strictly what the EU is doing. Uh, and are there other markets to follow? So. Not here to be doom and gloom, uh, just making sure everyone's aware of what's going on and what we're working on uh, as we as we navigate this and make sure no one's caught off by surprise as, as things start to change. So now that we have this bit of background, we know there's challenges out there. You know, what are we doing at Pulse Canada to help manage this risk of MRL non-compliance? Um, you know, we really take break this down into a short, medium, long-term approach uh, uh, to navigating these MRL non-compliances. Uh, that short term really being to, to mitigate, again, not eliminate, but mitigate uh, the immediate risk. So if there's uh, some of these actives where we know there's a, you know, for there's a, a low MRL in export markets, we know it's going to be a challenge. This is really important to just communicate that to the industry, you know, know that this, this vulnerability exists and, and do what we can to, to mitigate that. Um, a lot of this is really communicated uh, through the Keep It Clean program. Uh, it's really important to, to stay, up, stay up to date with what uh, messages are being promoted through that, that program. Um, as that's where we try and get it out to the industry uh, as wide as possible. In the medium term, uh, it takes a bit longer, but we work to attain the required MRL or import tolerance. So, you know, if we know there's a missing or misaligned MRL or um, an import tolerance is needed, we'll work with the product registrants to, to make sure that that's, that's been uh, made aware of, they're, they're made aware of it, and try to support them as much as we can uh, to get that MRL established or import tolerance established. 
a long-term approach, um, again, it, it's taking quite some time and, you know, it, it may seem lofty, but it's really trying to, to provide a, a solution to this whole issue. And it's really a broader multi-commodity, multi-country effort to advocate for harmonization of MRLs uh, through Codex, you know, certain international standards, get some regulatory cooperation and trade agreements and, and other avenues that we have uh, access to. And again, it's, it's trying to make sure that we're not misaligned. You know, there's no reason that we have different MRLs in export markets. Um, it's, it's unnecessary. It's not a food safety issue. It's, it's trade purposes. So trying to advocate for solutions that, um, you know, just fix this problem altogether. As, as in many cases, they're just not needed. And, and a lot of this work is done through the Canada Greens Council, but we're obviously uh, participating a lot in that, those working groups to, to, to help out as much as we can. Just a reminder, Greg, we have five minutes left. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so the Keep It Clean program, as I mentioned, this is where we um, try and communicate any of these short-term immediate risks uh, that, that are available to, to growers and the industry. So. Um, it's a, the Keep It Clean program is a, it's a joint uh, initiative between the Canola Council of Canada, Pulse Canada, Seals Canada, as well as the Barley Council of Canada and Perio Corps that provide funding. And it's, it's really just making sure that you're aware of, of any issues. This could be crop protection products and MRLs, this could be, you know, plant disease, um, any type of requirements that, that may pose a market risk or how to maintain a marketable crop uh, at the end of the season. All of it's available at keepitclean.ca. So just touching on some chickpea MRO requirements for, for some of our pre-harvest pre products. Um, I've only listed glyphosate, safflu, penicillin, and diquat here, but in most cases, we actually have fairly good MROs uh, for, for most of these products. Um, the only one I want to highlight here, or a couple highlights, is, is the, the glyphosate MRL. So currently right now, we do not have a glyphosate MRL for, for chickpeas at, at Codex. So Codex is really important, as I mentioned before, as, as a lot of uh, the smaller countries, or a lot of countries do have some type of deferral to Codex. So um, it would be really good to get that MRL established. So it just, you know, fills a, a, or eliminates a vulnerability. Um, this MRL is actually in queue. It was supposed to be established last year, but due to COVID that meeting was canceled. Um, so we're, we're extremely hopeful that that meeting will be virtual this year and it will get established uh, uh, this year and, and five years old. So really hopeful. Um, staff with Fenestil, very good harmonization. It is a bit lower in the EU, but uh, you know there's a good opportunity to, to highlight that uh, a misalignment does not necessarily equal a trade concern. Um, again, that margin of error and MRLs that I mentioned before, and being established based on maximum use patterns, so shortest PHI, maximum number of applications, that MRL may not be reflective of the current use of that product on the farm, where it's, it's much longer PHIs or, or just a single application, things like that. So. Um, misalignment is not always a cause for concern. Uh, and I'll see the same for diquat there as well. To meet MRO requirements, uh, it's, it's very important to use crop protection products that are acceptable to the export market. So if there's an export market that we, we've identified as, as being a vulnerability, you know, make sure that you're using crop protection products that, that won't cause any concern in that, that export market. It's really important to maintain that relationship with, with your buyers to understand where those vulner vulnerabilities may be. And it's extremely important to follow the label for application rate, timing, and PRS intervals of the products that you're using. Again, as mentioned, MRLs are established based on the, the label directions. So make sure that you're, you're maintaining those, those label directions in the use of crop protection products. Quickly highlight here um, the, the difference between maybe small lot shipments and, and bulk cargo. I uh, just want to highlight that the risk of an MRL non-compliance uh, can actually be a bit greater in a small lot shipment. So when we think of chickpeas, where, where a lot of products are being shipped by, by container, or if it's going to the United States by, by truck or rail car, um, there's a potential, you know, we don't have that blending capacity that we do in bulk cargo shipments in our small lot shipments. So when you blend product, that, that tends to reduce MRL risk because you're getting product from multiple different farms. If there wasn't experience, uh, you know, in a single field or, you know, something unfortunate happened, with blending that is reduced drastically. So uh, it's, it's important to understand the, the crop that you're working in. And if it's being exported in small lots, there's just an extra level of uh, attention that may be needed. Quickly touch on pre-harvest glyphosate here as well. Um, you know, I think this message has been getting out there, there quite a bit, but it's always good to revisit it, that uh, glyphosate is registered for pre-harvest perennial weed control. It's not used as a desiccant. Um, pre-harvest glyphosate should only be applied when the feed moisture content is less than 30% in the least mature part of the field. And this applies to, to any tank mix combination as well. Um, so, you know, hearing in the previous presentation that, you know, chickpeas may be uh, late to the party as far as shutting down, things like that, glyphosate is not the tool to end that party. 
um, you know, if you're applying that product when the, the seeds are, that seed moisture is still higher than 30%, we will get elevated residues. And it's just not a good tool to use in those situations. So, so make sure the tool is being used properly and use it properly at the, the right application timing. And finally, I just want to point to a couple of Keep It Clean resources that are available on the Keep It Clean website. Uh, we do have a product advisory that is, is um, published annually. We're currently in the kind of the, the review phase right now for, for next year's advisory, and, and hopefully we'll have an update here in, in the next month or so of, of what that update advisory may look like. Um, hopefully it brings greater clarity to the industry, as well as any concerns that, that may be identified. There's a, also a glyphosate staging guide on there as well that, that may be useful for, for chickpeas, but also for all pulse crops and, and other crops in the program. And I don't have it here, but obviously this is, that pulse website's a great resource as well. Uh, there's some harvest management uh, fact sheets that are, are good to revisit uh, as well. So with that, um, my contact information is here. Happy to discuss any of these issues or answer any questions. Feel free to reach out at any time. And um, you know, hopefully we can answer some questions uh, during our panel here as well. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for your presentation. I think the message here is important that uh, for all the producers and advisors that we keep keep market access for pulses open and exports moving. We're now going to move into the live question and answer featuring an agronomist and a presenter panel. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them into the question box on your dashboard and Sherilyn will address the questions to the panelists. On today's panel, I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Bruce with Holman Farming Group. Kira Dunstan with Cargill and Troy McInnes with Moose Jaw Co-op, as well as all our presenters. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Sherilyn, you're welcome to start asking questions. Great. So this is a, a great opportunity to get a lot of the questions answered that came in during the presentations, um, as well as ones that had come in, you know, sort of the Takes the pressure off me for later. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in uh, my industry, you know, where I'm practicing around the Moose Jaw area, really the 2019 year it really came to the forefront of this new pathogen, a new disease. Felt a little guilty in that, you know, we weren't really in the hardest affected areas. I think it was around uh, mid to late July. I was scouting chickpea crops with the anticipation of maybe letting off the accelerator a little bit given that uh, disease pressure was low, plasticite or otherwise, and all of a sudden, bang, it showed up. Now, from my perspective, uh, very light pressure, some of the wilting of the leaflets never really had an effect on my yields, or my grower's yields, I should say. I sometimes treat these crops like my own. But, um, you know, it's, it's there, it's noted both years, and it hasn't really been a yield influencer, but it gets your attention. So for my area, that's what we've seen. And, you know, I don't know that you've really missed anything. I think sometimes when we look at the symptoms that are discussed in relation to this disease, I myself, you know, some are very characteristic and agree when you see the leaflets wilted off. Sometimes when you see the chlorosis around the leaf, you, you wonder whether it's something else or is it the new disease? But um, that's been my experience. We've had some years where the chickpeas are coming in very, very fast, starting August 1st, which has really snuffed out any real disease potential, but it's there. And luckily we've been able to escape any significant damage. You're one of the fortunate then. Good. Yes. Thank you, thank you for your thoughts. Um, Jesse, would you like to comment from your perspective? Sure. Uh, I wasn't in any fields this summer that were suspected of having this newer issue. Uh, Ascochyta was 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 an issue in in some of the ones I was in, but but the newer issue didn't seem to be popping its head up. Uh, anecdotally, just from talking to guys in the area where where I was doing some scouting, uh, the feedback I had was was just mostly centered on on crop rotation. And uh, the fields that I were in were on a minimum of five-year rotation. And uh, I don't know if that had anything to do with, with the lack of disease. It, it certainly likely benefited, but uh, it sounded like the fields that were concerned in the area were on a shorter rotation in that uh, three to four-year range. And uh, I guess the research that you guys are working on will, will give us a bit more insight on, on how much that's helping, but uh, it certainly, seem to benefit uh, 
the growers that I was speaking with this past summer anyways. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just share my experiences. Um, I cover a fairly large territory in southern Saskatchewan, so I saw quite a few fields that this showed up in. Um, from what I've learned from it, I think that the biggest thing was, I don't know if it's a disease or if it's something that's leading to just stress on the plant that makes it more vulnerable to disease. Um, but something that I kind of learned is um, if you can catch and get a hold of the ascochyta part of it, that can really help it um, have something better to come back from in the end because um, for the most part, all of the infected fields seem to really bounce back pretty good more towards the end of July, early August. Um, it really showed me the resilience, I guess, of chickpeas because they really branched out um, whether or not those flowers and those pods ended up finishing and contributing to yield, um, it's really tough to say, but um, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I learned from it is making sure that, you know, you're catching that ascochyta really early and that you're really managing your disease really well because that's just another stress that those chickpeas are going to have to overcome and you really don't want that to happen. Um, it was really dry in the spring for the most part in most of my territory. so. Um, guys were kind of making that decision on oh when should I speak going forward what I'm going to try and do is maybe um, stick to that stage of maybe around that eight node stage because uh, I think the severity of the wind spread spores is probably what um, is really spreading it quite a bit in my drier territories. So that's kind of what I learned from it. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate everybody's thoughts and views and what they see because we all look at it from different perspectives. Um, now, you mentioned Ascochyta, and we know Ascochyta is the biggest sort of disease that, that is confirmed in chickpeas. Um, and, um, you know, there's still a lot of, of unknowns with it, and it's a very difficult disease to manage, and Ken presented a lot of information on that. Um, I guess from an agronomist perspective, could each of you sort of give us our, your thoughts on when you typically look at spraying or recommending first applications of fungicides go on, and how you determine what product to use? And I'll throw it back at you, Kira, first, since you were the last one to answer the first question. Yeah, okay, so um, like I said, I'm gonna probably stick around that eight node stage. Um, depending on the conditions, if it's really dry, um, I might even throw in maybe a foliar nutrition product. Um, and then I usually go with uh, like a strobilurin product that's obviously mixed. I would never spray a strobilurin by itself, but um, probably around like that Miravis Neo or Diax products, and then maybe save some of my mold products for later. Thank you, Jesse. I think Kira puts it fairly well. I, I mean, every every spring we're dealing with different conditions, so I guess uh, I would take into account how wet or, or cool it is. But uh, trying to target something, uh, if you're if you're looking at some of your first flowers showing up in that 12 to 14 node, uh, something you know a, a you know 10 to 14 days ahead of that. Uh, and that's going to be dictated by growing conditions, of course. But uh, and there, there's lots of great, uh, great products available. Um, just getting a, a a good tag mix partner from what, for whatever your strawberry is, uh, depending on environmental conditions, I guess. Thank you, Joy. So, from my perspective, uh, I'm hearing a lot of what's been said. Uh, I really. Do not want to hesitate on that first application. Once it gets into that seven, eight, nine node stage, you know, I'm really watching the forecast and trying to keep ahead of any weather event to make sure that first application is on. The comment earlier by Kira with the winds and spreading the spores, I don't know if there's ever any zero risk. I mean, they look healthy. We've had two dry springs, but again, I maybe uh, you know I have some fun conversations with my growers on that first app and wonder why we're going so early but I have not regretted it in the last two seasons for sure with all the disease that pops up later on I'm feeling I'm ahead of it 
again, I'm going to save some of my stronger Haskakita actives to later in the season, probably at that early flower to pod when that canopy is developing conditions that are going to cause more disease pressure. So, you know, that type of thing is going on. Strobies first, you know, shut those off, make sure we're tank mixing with strobies and doing the best can thing we can do, you know, trying to keep mindful of rotating herbicide, of, pardon me, rotating fungicide groups according to resistance management. But that is a balance depending on disease pressure and the fungicides you have to work with. And once it gets into, you know, four applications or you know, sometimes more, not that it happens very often, as Ken all said earlier, it gets complicated. But uh, for me, the take home is do not be late on the first application is the big thing I would say. Thank you guys. And, and I'm glad you slipped up there, Troy, on the herb mentioning herbicides, because I think we do, or I know we do have a question on herbicides. So that's a great lead in to that. Um, so for the three of you, before we get into the questions for the other panelists, if you have a new grower, what is your sort of recommendation for weed management? What sort of herbicide options and plans um, do you like to see in your fields that help mitigate managing herbicide resistance, whether it's group two broadleaf weeds or, or the grassy weeds that are resistant to the group one? This time I'm gonna put Jesse on first. Uh, I would focus really hard on, on your weed map this fall is, is a really great time to be paying attention to your perennials because you don't have very good options at all in crop and so uh, a good a good fall weed management program is going to be important uh, pay very close attention to to your herbicide history in years prior make sure that you don't have anything on there that's uh, that's going to be a problem uh, products like authority and some of its its partners that you can get it with now can can work really really well uh, with kosha being a fairly big issue uh, in pulse country, uh, it's a nice option to look at, um, particularly since we're dealing with with more and more resistance issues cropping up in that all of the time. Uh, pay close attention to your your Sancor husbandry if if you're if that's the product of choice for you uh, in crop. Uh, you're going to see some Sancor burn likely one way or the other, but but watch your rates and keep your water volumes really, really high. And if you're coming into a season where where your where your your subsoil moisture is really, really low, uh, pay particularly close attention to to rain call forecasts um, and seeding depth for for your seed, so that you're reducing the risk of having uh, that Sancor product washing down into your root zone and and further harming your crop. Uh, if you if you have dry soils, of course, you're at more risk for that because that soil is going to allow that moisture to soak in really, really quick, and uh, your potential for damage is a little bit higher. Thank you, Troy. Would you like to go next? I'm um, sure. Uh, again, uh, getting ahead of your perennial weeds, like just said, is huge um, for our area. Given kosha and the resurgence in that weed the last three to four years, you know things are in a drier trend. Really, I don't see a replacement for a product like Authority. It's your best soil applied ahead to look after that. So that's the main one to rely on. I would put a plug in for a product like Authority Supreme, just because you, whether you really need that extra grassy control with that product or not, it's introducing another group, which is going to help with your resistance management of your grassy weeds. So it's sort of a side benefit. I mean, there's agronomic reasons for using every product, including Authority Supreme, but by adding the grassy component to Supreme, it is a, a benefit for managing different different uh, groups to manage your grassy weeds. Uh, set the expectation with all the group two resistant weeds, or you know, sometimes there's some healthy populations there. It's just hard to avoid it that you may have to use Sencor. And if you use Sencor, be be, uh, you know, be mindful of water volumes and rates and going early and setting realistic uh, expectations. And I'd say some of the most common conversations I've had around weed control the last two years and not specific to chickpeas is trying to make sure uh, the growers have a, a good appreciation for some of those soil applied herbicides. It's not a switch. They need rain to activate, but to stay activated, there's certain conditions. It's going to have to keep them in soil solution to let them do their job. So we need the soil applieds. They're a huge part of the solution for chickpeas, 
but really need to understand how they're activated and how they work to to help our customers and our growers with that. So that would be that would be my comments. Thanks, Troy. Kira, do you have more to add to this? I think it was pretty well covered, but I guess I'll just add like the soil applied herbicides that have been mentioned um, are really nice for adding that extra group, like Troy had said. Um, we're seeing probably a, a I don't want to say a higher incidence of wild oat resistance, but probably a higher severity where um, the patches have grown so large that um, I'm hearing a lot more growers become aware that they maybe have some resistance in their fields. So um, I think it's really nice, like a crop like chickpeas, you do have a lot of options that you can use um, pre-seed that you might not necessarily have available in front of other crops. So um, just looking at those different options and utilizing those different groups where you have that opportunity will really help to ensure that you aren't getting that huge population of um, even kochia. The kochia options are really great in front of chickpeas um, and wild oats and group two resistant mustard and all those kinds of weeds. So, yeah. Well, thank you guys. Now I'm going to move on to some questions from for our presenters, and I'm going to start with um, Bunyaman Tehran as the first question for our presenters. And the question, while while Bunyaman is becoming coming on side here, is if you're a new chickpea grower. Today. We presented a lot of information on the different varieties and some of the newer varieties out there, um, but the commercially available varieties are mainly the Leader and the Orion, CDC Palmer, um, and some of the older varieties. What really is the best choice going forward and how do growers make that decision? Thank you, Sarlin, uh, for the questions. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. So I think uh, looking at the, the reality that we are facing here and then a lot of uh, uncertainty to what cause there is a problem, but we do not know what it is. So I would suggest for the growers to start with uh, uh, just CDC leader to start with and then do the management as recommended by at least the three agronomists here, disease management. So thank you, Troy, Kira, Jesse for putting that to growers to spray around eight nodes or early spray. This is the message that I've been doing when I did the extension meeting for years uh, to farmers around the province. But quite often I, I get the comments from the farmers, you are spraying the soil, you're not spraying the plants at that stage because you see the plants really small. You don't even see the plants at that time when you spray fungicides, but that's the really critical thing. So for the new growers, Big CDC leader and then do the management as recommended by the agronomist. The most critical one is the first spray of fungicide to give the protection around eight node states. That's kind of the average or kind of the latest probably around 10 node states. That's really critical to give the protection for the plants because once you miss that, the canopy start growing. That's when you start the effectiveness of your fungicide application because you're not uh, be able to, to kind of control uh, the spore under the leaves. Okay, so, so just so you know that we are uh, one of the growing regions where we have both, uh, uh, what is the sexual and asexual cycles of this disease. Australia, they don't have the sexual cycle, so they have a little bit less diversity than ours here. So probably that's Sherilyn, what my comment is. Okay, so just to follow up on that, so if a grower has CDC Orion seed and they're trying to make that decision whether to, you know, kind of dump that seed and, and try the new seed leader, is there enough advantage to leader to justify switching seed or switching varieties? If you have Orion, I'm sorry, can you repeat again? If you have CDC Orion seed? Yes, if you what already you have, have seed. Yeah, you can just grow, but again, follow all the recommendations for good management of the crop. That's probably the, the critical thing. Follow the, the recommendation for rotations, crop management, weed control, so all kind of in a package. So, so that's uh, keep the plant healthy. What happened is that what I've seen, 
within our plots. This this problem arise early, and then if you don't have a good control of the disease, asukaita will come and then just took over the crops right away. So so that that's really so so give the protection after uh, the crop. So even with Orion, if you have a good seed of Orion and then do carefully and then follow all the recommendations for crop good crop management, including fungicide application, herbicide, and all those things. Thank you. And one more question for yeah, that's that's great. One more question for you, um, and then we'll move on to another presenter. We've got so many great questions, and we're not going to get to all of them today, but we will send them out, get them answered, and then post the answers to the questions as well as the recordings of the presentation um, later this week. Um, so the one question that did come in that might be a quick answer for you is, what is the market for the black desi chickpea that you mentioned? Okay, so uh, traditionally, uh... In Iran, there is a market for this black desi that you consume that. But then I also received some requests here from the organic growers. They want kind of spray cells and then to produce chickpeas that kind of will fit in with their market, with their system. So that's what the black desi. This is, I'm not going to expect black desi becoming like a big crop. No, I think we have to maintain that uh, specific opportunity for farmers. So. This is a market that traditionally occurred in in Iran and that where black desi is quite popular as a snack and product in the country. Perfect, thank you. Um, the question for Lana. So a great presentation on intercropping. And one of the questions that did come in is how should we best manage balanced rotations when we are considering intercropping a pulse and an oil seed into the same year? This forces us to maybe look at a two-year cereal rotation or a one-year pulse or oil. Um, do you have comments on how the intercrop fits into the whole rotation? Yeah. So, so one of my approaches to this, it, it seems to work best with a four-year rotation. And, and we need to keep in mind that not all pulses and oil seeds share the same diseases and pests. So if you're growing one brassica in the rotation, then maybe don't grow another brassica. Um, but, and, and the same thing with pulses, that chickpeas don't really share diseases with things like lentils or peas. The phanomyces isn't a, an issue that affects chickpeas. So um, my recommendation is generally just to to approach the idea of crop rotations with a bit more complexity, instead of looking at the larger groups of oilseed pulse cereal, look at that more on individual crop level. And, and there may be things that you can put into a four-year rotation, alternate broadleaf crops with monocrop cereals. And you could have a one intercrop in a four-year crop cycle and still possibly incorporate some other things. Now, it gets tricky trying to have this in a rotation with canola, frankly, because canola volunteers are not great. If you've got a handle on canola volunteers, then, and you're using a shatter tolerant canola and getting very low seed on the ground, then that's maybe isn't a problem. But it's just a, a warning to be careful with, with uh, a canola in rotation with this. Um, and yeah, but if you start start with cereal stubble on this rotation, that works relatively quite well. Thank you. And one final kind of quick question for the presenters, and I'm going to put Greg Bartley on the spot here. What can a grower do to ensure residues are well within acceptable ranges? Is there testing that can be done to ensure their samples have no issues before they sell the seed? Yeah, so the easiest thing to do is typically just follow the label direction on the product. So make sure you're using products that are, you know, registered for use on that crop and also stay within those limits. So as I mentioned, the maximum residue limits are based on those label directions. And, you know, there is a, a quite a range that that's, uh, makes them acceptable. Like it's based on the tightest PHI, the, the maximum number of applications it could be used for the season, and then a margin error on top of that. So if you're simply following the label directions, you should be well within limits within Canada. Now the, the issue is, is those export market MRLs. If those MRLs are misaligned and lower, 
then there may be cases where you know we just simply have to monitor our current uses and and see if we meet those MRLs. And that's where that's the tricky part. That's that's maybe not as applicable to to the farm. As far as getting tested, then there is a testing capacity in private labs. They, they can be quite expensive, but if you work with your agronomists or if, uh, if your agronomists are, are looking for this option for, for your farmers, uh, you can reach out to me. I can get you in contact with some private labs to uh, get some of that testing done. You know, it is possible, but again, can be a little expensive. Um, the other thing is, is to, to work with your grain buyers. You know, in many cases, there is some quality assurance programs. There are quality assurance programs in place. And you know there may be opportunity to get some feedback from from the from your buyers if if you're within range or have any questions. You know I, I think they're they're willing to work with their farmers to make sure that the product they receive is going to meet the needs of the export customers as well. Thank you. I think that wraps up our question and answer period. Um, we've got tons more questions and that, that we just don't have time to answer. And we have really appreciate the panelists and the presenters here today. And with that, um, I will turn it back over to Brad. As Brad is having some troubles with his audio, um, I think we can say a big thank you to everyone that's that's here and for all the presenters all the question and answers we will provide information um, in terms of response to the questions as well as the recordings will be available and everybody that participated will be getting the links